we would design better buildings if we had different voices at the table designing those buildings. Episode 164. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Jake Rudin and Erin Pellegrino, founders of Out of Architecture, a career consulting firm interested in exploring the value of the skills both in and out of the architectural profession. So Jake has a decade of experience in building things from the ground up. He, at Adidas, he led the teams in computational design, digital technologies, and pattern engineering. Previously, Jake was the director of the business of business development at an edtech startup um, he worked around the world as a designer for top architecture and design firms and has taught extensively in the architecture and design fields erin is a designer and registered architect with a decade of experience in the field of design business development and creative consulting she currently works as the founder and principal of matter a design firm that problem solves that span from brand and digital experiences to the built environment. She's worked extensively in the venture and startup space in the Northeast with early stage companies, as well as VC funds on design, visual narrative strategy and brand development. Erin has also taught and coached in architecture and design fields at universities, including Harvard, Cornell, Parsons, the City University of New York and New Jersey Institute of Technology. This episode is really interesting. It's a fascinating conversation because Jake and Erin discuss the disconnect between architectural education and the profession. Um, We talk a lot about how our skills and training can actually be incredibly valuable to many different roles in different industries and how you can actually make that transition out of architecture and utilize the skill set architectural thinking and use it to create a architectural career that is bespoke and fits you. So I think this is one of the most important conversations that we have here at Business of Architecture, which is the potential of architecture um, outside of the traditional domain and the potential for using your architectural skill set in a new way, in a new business, in a new career. So sit back, relax and enjoy Jake Rudin and Erin Pellegrino. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Erin and Jake, welcome to the Business of Architecture. A pleasure to have you. How are you both? Doing well, thank you. It's uh, it's great to be here, so thanks. Excellent. Thanks and so much, Ryan. Great. And where are you both calling in from? I'm so calling I'm, in uh, from calling Portland, in from Oregon. New York. Okay, wait. So Portland, Oregon and in New York. We're bi-coastal, <laughs> but we speak at the exact same time. I love it. I love it. Now, you guys are the founders of Out of Architecture, which is, for me, one of the most interesting and exciting agencies. Is that the right word to describe it? Or a consulting platform or a coaching platform or company, let's call it. I mean, it's, I think it's a bit of all of those things. Uh, we think of ourselves as, as coaches and consultants. Um, to start, but I, I, I suppose agency would be a good ideal or a good mm-hmm. goal to, to reach towards. We've always at, at the core of it, thought of it as a, as a business. Great. And the, the reason why it's so interesting is that you're like us, uh, you know, I was describing it to somebody else the other day. Tell me if I've got this wrong, but I was, I was kind of calling it like a, it's almost like rehab in a way. And you're, you're, it's, you're helping architects move into new and exciting disciplines and careers, because this is something that the industry talks about a lot. And we all know, theoretically, that we're architects, we could probably be useful somewhere else. But you guys are actually facilitating and helping take that talent and architectural thinking and opening up pathways and avenues into other disciplines and industries. Is that, is that a fair synopsis? Well, how would you would absolutely it? say so? Yeah, I think it's, you know, we, I mean, we call it out of architecture. First of all, the name business of architecture was taken. Um, <sighs> so we had to, to look for something else, you know, that, that didn't quite as aptly describe it as a business. But, uh, you know, in 
in essence, I mean, it is very much um, a consultancy that, it, you know, or I mean, it's rehab without maybe quite the uh, specific 12 steps or 13 steps or however many you'd like to ascribe, but it does have um, this, this very simple component of saying it's okay to not be a traditional architect or an architect mm. in the traditional sense of the word. Um, it goes very much to, I think the, the issues that architects have describing even what the profession is or what we do to those beyond it. It's mm -hmm. a very complicated, very intricate, very diverse profession when it comes to the diversity of thought, when it comes to the diversity of skills. And all of those things coalesce in a final product, which just happens to be a building. Yes. But what we try to do is to separate the individual and their career path and goals from this idea of just the built environment of only being able to end in a building or in CDs or to have a complete documentation set. So how did this come about? How did this as a service kind of emerge? It sort of happened organically and by accident. And I think by, um, starting off with the fact that Jake and I have been friends and collaborators for a very long time, starting in our first year of architecture school. And one of the things that we mutually realized was really two things. We complained a lot and we talked about money a lot. Um, the architect and, blues. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, even as students, uh, you know, we would get into um, various business endeavors or, or various <laughs> methods of making trouble um, and trying to figure out, you know, our identities as, as architects or really just as, as people with a unique set of skills, um, each of them different in this case, obviously Jake and I are different individuals, but always coming back to really thinking about this profession or the profession at the time that we were entering into as something that we could really curate and design for ourselves as well. And I think there was a real benefit to having a partner in crime in that because we were able to really spitball and talk about these ideas um, without perhaps some of the shame we often hear our clients bring where they're almost sort of whispering, like, I, I think I might want to leave. Um, so I think it started initially with complaining a lot and, and talking about money, but the reality is it also started with, we joke that we were our own first, first clients. And then um, people would come to us for advice and it got to a point where the volume was such that we felt uh, we might be onto something. Could, could you tell us a, a, a little bit about both your respective careers then and how they've kind of unfolded and have taken the, uh, like a, a, the unconventional pathway, if you like. Sure. Um, so Jake and I both went to undergrad together and got our uh, bachelor's of architectures from Cornell. Um, and then promptly both went to the uh, Harvard Grad School of Design. I chose the MR2 track, which I believe is now uh, defunct or at least named something else. And I'll let Jake talk about um, his career track. But uh, essentially the the M2 program was really meant and touted as this idea that we are creating the practitioners of the future or the practitioners and the thinkers of the future. And I was excited to be there. You know, one of our professors would joke that it was architecture Hollywood, but I also quickly realized um, when you peek behind the curtain, if they were creating the practitioners of the future, they were doing an awful job of it. My mm -hmm. professional practice class was terrible. Um, it talked about how to, you know, um, lie to the IRS and how to get away with not paying interns and how to pretend you have a larger practice than you do. And um, it disillusioned me because we're, we were down the street from the best, you know, business school in the country, arguably. And it made me branch out and go mm -hmm. take classes in other, other colleges. So the, the Kennedy school um, and the business school, and it made me realize that once you leave the nebulous of, of our, or the nucleus of architecture, um, you become the sort of unicorn in the room and people are fascinated by how you think and you have this unique set of skills that they um, admire and, and can put to use. And I think 
when leaving the GSD, I, I really, I clung to that idea. Not that I didn't love my cohort and I didn't love my education, but I realized that the influence and the impact of being an architect could, um, could be wider than I initially thought, um, mm-hmm. which was empowering in a lot of ways. Um, of the two of us, I actually did go on to, to get the sort of stamp. So I am a licensed architect and I do build buildings. Um, but for me, after the GSD, it was really important to, to get educated in business and try to understand the way the world and economies and projects work holistically. And it's become important to me that we realize that, you know, there are so many things that architects and ex-architects and recovering architects can do to have influence in the world that are beyond the traditional path. So out of architecture is that for me, but as is my practice as a way to, you know, iterate on that idea and redefine what it means to be an architect. And you're you're currently um, teaching as well. You're, you're you're in practice. You run your own practice studio, um, Matter. Is that right? And yes, and I teach professional practice now. <laughs> so Hurrah. I get to, yeah, I get to revisit um, the class that I thought could be more useful, and um, I'll occasionally teach studios as well um, that have a design build component to be more engaged in the community. Um, so again, architecture sort of having an impact beyond the the traditional. Fantastic. And, and Jake, how has your, what was your career path? I know that you've, you, you stepped further away, if you like, from the classical architectural mode. In some ways, in some ways, I stepped right into what I always loved about architecture. I think Mm. I went to school, I felt so enamored. I mean, even, uh, you know, prior to officially starting at Cornell, I went to the the summer college program as a, a sort of senior in high school. And uh, during that time, the summer before my kind of final year um, in high school, I, I I was spending quite a lot of time dabbling uh, in the wood shop. And I, I always loved building things. I loved putting things together. And that theme carried heavily into my time in architecture. I had no idea that architects built models when I was in, in high school. And so to discover that, and then to have the opportunity of five years of access to table saws and CNC mills and laser cutters and all of these things just was fabulous for me. It really could not have been something that I enjoyed more. And especially because it was tied to very intense, iterative, creative problem solving. To me, that was the ultimate, the pinnacle in a career. Mm -hmm. And as I sort of dabbled in these internships, as I dipped my toe into the real world, I realized more and more that that was something I would have a very difficult time doing in traditional architecture as, as kind of my full-time position. Um, I thought, okay, I love academia so much, you know, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so uh, like Aaron went for a graduate degree and was teaching and and sort of under the assumption that I would, you know, pursue some tenure track position at a, at an architectural school, mm-hmm. something that was accredited that I could, you know, continue this, this love affair. Um, and I was, I was sort of disillusioned multiple times and, um, and there's a, a story I've told very frequently about an interview that went awry um, where I was, in fact, interviewing for a position that the HR person told me did not exist. So they had uh, held up this director of digital innovation position. I went in to interview for that. They said, well, we're just looking for a BIM manager. And that was sort of the last straw for me. Uh, I went to work for a startup um, that was uh, actually owned and run by an architect, but it was in education technology. It was a VR startup. Um, You know, I like to describe it as kind of Sims meets Second Life meets Zoom. And uh, that was about five years ago. Had it been five years later, I would probably still be doing that. But, (laughs) um, you know, there is truth in being too early. Um, But after doing that, I moved out here to Portland Um, My wife, who was at the time still a practicing architect, and I kind of came over here and I interviewed for a number of positions. I interviewed at traditional firms. I interviewed at game design companies. I interviewed at uh, for product management roles, actually interviewed for um, a very famous uh, disaster of a company, the Fire app. 
uh, company and had, oh. you know, was very lucky not to hear back from them uh, during that <laughs> spring. <laughs> um, and I always wondered why until I, I saw the documentary, but I did end up uh, having an interview at Adidas. And what I experienced when I went in there, I just didn't, I, I had no idea that it existed. I went in, I saw a shop, I saw a sample studio with fabrication tools. I saw 3D printers. I saw a laser cutter. I saw a wood shop. And I I kind of turned to someone who was sort of giving me a tour. And I said, do they use this to make shoes? And they said, oh yeah. Yeah, we build models of shoes. We build the full shoes. We prototype. You know, we, we have this entire innovation department that's always testing ideas. And after the interview, I had gone through my portfolio and shown all of these like skills, Adobe Creative Suite, so on and so forth. And they loved all of it. They didn't just want me to do one thing. They weren't just interested in my, you know, my core, I guess at the time it would be Rhino was my, Mm -hmm. the skill that they were hiring me for, but they were exuberant that I had casted with silicone and played with plaster and done all of these kind of drawings and studies and love technology And I'm still there five years later and I just absolutely love it. And it is the picture that I would have painted for myself just without buildings. Amazing. For people, well, what, first of all, what, what is this disjunct that happens from your, from your perspective? And this is, this is something that I hear. I've experienced it myself in my own architectural education you go through this wildly intense, creative um, adventure at university. A lot of it is, you know, uncomfortably detached from reality. Um, and then you can move out into practice. And for some people, and certainly my own experience, what, what was in architectural practice was so far away from university experience that there was a, you know, there was a, a definite sort of dissonance and, you know, a shock, if you like, and this creates this kind of searching around. What, what, what is this void? Like, where does it, where does it come from? And- yeah, I mean, I think we spend a lot of time, I think, individually thinking about this, but also talking to our, our clients about this and potential clients and, and just ruminating on it. We, we definitely, we call it the disconnect. Actually, Jake and I did a doodle for it the other day because it's it's going to be a chapter in a, a book that we're writing. But um, I think it's it's multifaceted and it exists in a couple of different ways. The first being, I think, in most cases, when you go to college, um, and we went to architecture school as as babies, ostensibly, right? We went for undergrad, which means I started undergrad at seventeen, mm-hmm. essentially a teenager. Um, and you go to school or you go to college, or at least I did, thinking that you're going to be prepared with a set of skills to enter the world and then go start affecting those skills on, on the world. And the reality is college teaches you how to think. And architecture school really reteaches you how to think and how to see. And then you do get into the real world and you're not necessarily totally prepared for it, but you were prepared to learn all the things you need to learn mm. to be successful in that profession. And that may be true of a lot of different professions as well, but I think it's acutely true in architecture and also the difference is so stark. Yeah. Um, it's known very well that, you know, in, our, in, in school, it's all about you and in the real world, it's nothing to do with you. But I think part of the disconnect comes from the fact that if you choose architecture as a profession and you stick with it, especially if you do a, a five-year or even as a master's, you choose to go and do add another three or four years onto your education, you're doing that as some form of an idealist than an optimist. If your thinking is, I'm going to go into this world to put buildings there, you do that from a point of, of idealism. And it probably comes from a, a really wholesome and, and important place of, of value and of passion. And then you go into the working world and oftentimes you're met with a much different type of uphill battle. You may be met with people who have all the best intentions, but perhaps never really learned how to manage well. Mm-hmm. Or you're met with people who are incredibly burnt out. And and while you'd love to learn from them, they don't have the capacity to do that. And I think often you're met with a struggle that is unlike the pace of school where you you toil and you stay awake and you, you, you know, there's two weeks where you don't sleep very much 
but then you have a final review, it's great and it's over. In the profession, that has the ability to be so much more drawn out. Mm -hmm. And it becomes much harder, I think, to see the milestones be something that is achievable with the stamina that we have as maybe perhaps also a generation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's much harder. There are barriers to entry that are, are financial, that are cultural, that you know are touch on all these different issues. And I think the profession has really yet to modernize to meet the changing sort of generation of, of who's coming into it in such a way that it can foster that type of talent. Um, and again, I don't think that that's necessarily just an architectural problem, but we, I felt that acutely. I see that you know, and, and I feel that that is definitely my my take on it. Jake, thank you very much. That's great. Jake, what what are your thoughts on the on the this disconnect? To play off a little bit of what Aaron is saying, there uh, there are a couple of things. One is that in the profession, as she mentioned, you know, this cadence it's on repeat, but it's on repeat at double speed, and certainly. You know, we go through these sort of team formation moments. We, uh, you know, we have forming, storming, norming, performing. We get through these stages, right? And once you're performing, um, you know, you're you're supposed to just be be good, right? You continue on in perpetuity until until death. <laughs> and I think there there are some very real differences there. And and by death, I I actually mean burnout. Um, but you know, sort of the death of, of one's professional life and in some senses and requires rebirth in architecture, there's a micro scale of that where we take on these projects and whether they're charrettes or competitions or long projects, they are still very intense. And even a long project has deadlines weekly, monthly, and there is, um, there is no stopping certainly. Um, you know, this gets a little further down the line to burnout rather than the the disconnect. But to round out the thought, there is a fifth stage in in team formation, and it's forming, storming, norming, performing, and then celebrating. And that fifth stage of taking time and recovering, and allowing for uh, you know a moment of um, of appreciation. That was what I think finals gave us in in undergraduate and or the separation of semesters or courses or things like that. Um, We don't do that in professional practice. Mm. We we just run people through the gamut. And I would say that the other, um, you know, I'm again, I'm going to steal something that I've heard heard Aaron say many times. But there is a there is an issue just with the fact that we call each other professionals. I mean, certainly, you know, a profession is, is something that you profess to, right, in an almost religious sense. And we treat architecture like a religion. So in school, you are told that, uh, you know, the payment for the work that you do is this love that you feel, right? And that professing, that, prof- you know, profession of just this absolute adoring, you know, focus on architecture, this unyielding, unwavering truth um, is sort of held up to be the standard um, that we enter the profession with. Now, once you leave school, if what you have fallen in love with is no longer present, what are you taking away from the work that you do? You know, then as a professional, you're professing to something that doesn't exist, or you are, you know, tied to maybe a religious belief and you sort of realize, oh my goodness, you know, the, the power of architecture that I thought, you know, was next to, you know, godliness or next to some, you know, sort of untouchable state at the pinnacle of design. Uh, it's really about details. And the, the common joke is door schedules, right? It's really about you know, putting together a door schedule or a window schedule and, and just ironing out something that in, at the end of the day has to be built. And I think for many of us, that is heartbreaking. I, I, and, I, I, I could feel it. I, this, mm. you, just, you describe in this, there's an emotional response I'm having. It's like, oh gosh, this, you know, the, 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 the 
you know, the subject that you fall in love with and then the, you know, perhaps some of your professional experiences can be so wildly different. And I'm not saying that profession, the profession is beautiful as well. It has its own richness and and things, but it's, it, it really is a big sort of cognitive shift in many ways. And I suppose one of the questions is, you know, why, it, well, first of all, is this intensive training of architectural thought and thinking, is it actually relevant to a job as a practicing architect in the construction industry? Or is the architectural thinking actually, is it, is it better somewhere else? I, I would maybe just very quickly say, I think it is relevant, although it is not utilized in the proper way. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think that architecture firms, we, we constantly talk about the issue of how architects bill themselves, not just from an actual monetary standpoint, but how they market the work that they do. And we don't do a good job of describing to clients the myriad benefits to the various methods of exploration, design techniques, you know, the, all of the things that we're taught to, to think about in, in school. I also think that, you know, there's, there's a lot happening all at once. One being just this sort of growth of technology um, in the architecture and engineering industry is always lagging behind and construction. Sorry. So that's always a bit of a a 10 year delay to the rest of um, what technologies other, other areas and sectors are using. Uh, And I think that that's, fine and indicative of the fact that buildings still take a while to to form and design and build and and occupy. That being said, I think an architectural education, and obviously I'm biased, is an incredibly useful one. Um, I would never undo the either of the the places I, I went to. And I think in some respects, I often, you know, I'm lucky enough that I get to teach, so I get to kind of go back. But if I weren't, I would, I would miss it. I would miss the sort of intensity, the the passion, the the discovery, the ability to fail repeatedly and and learn. Right? Um, it was a playground, and it was absolutely fantastic. It was intense, and I'm I'm really glad I did it when I did. I think though there is a little bit of a. Um, a reckoning with the fact that the things that you learn in architecture school do not just fall under the umbrella of being an architect. And I think if we were to celebrate that more, we would realize and we would foster a culture of understanding our value in the world, not just in the world of architecture. I think Mm -hmm. we have a somewhat very introspective and introverted profession. And for something that consistently, for the most part, interfaces with society, it's a little too introverted. I think we're very into ourselves and what we do. And this ability to talk about what we do in a clear and concise way, convey our value and convey our our means to be necessary um, is lacking. And the more we could, I think, teach students to recognize that within themselves, the more from a bottom-up perspective, we could do that with the profession as a whole. Um, And I say that simply because to do it from the top down, I would, we'd probably have to be having this discussion with, you know, the leaders in the, in the profession today who are, you know, interested in other things. And, and that's absolutely fine. But the education itself, while disconnected from the, the profession as it stands today, I don't think has to be disconnected from the future of, of where the profession could be mm. and the, the expanding term of what it means to, to be someone who's educated in the field of architecture and design. I, I think it's so, it, interesting this this you know topic of um the the kind of highly developed skill sets that we learn as architects and then the fact that most the majority of people who train as an architect and learn all these you know um skills of synthesizing ideas and of looking at things from multiple viewpoints and dealing with complexity and you know essentially being a kind of a deep generalist this is very you know, this is a very, very good, useful set of human skills for living, for creating businesses, for creating anything. Um, that there's such a strong pull, if you like, through a very structured pro, um, st- a structured path to becoming an architect. And, and and this is why it's so interesting that you know the the your your business is actually, you know, 
are you actively redirecting people or are you finding that there is this there is a big need or a big want or a big desire of people going i want to get off this path but i don't know how so so we we have clients that come to us in what we call sort of crisis mode so mm-hmm. they've hit burnout and they're just they're just done um And we had a lot of those, especially during the pandemic, not surprisingly, Mm -hmm. Um, but we had quite a few before that as well. And for those, those types of clients, I think the first thing to do is to just sort of, we, we try to settle and and let them know that where they're at is, is temporary and, and not okay, but it can be okay, or it's going to be okay. Right. So we joke that sometimes um, it's architecture therapy. Um, Although, Disclaimer, we are not therapists. Um, but typically what we try to do with clients, whether they're in crisis or not, is, is get to know them you know, in totality, not just as what we call like the, the noun crisis, them saying, if I'm not going to be an architect or I don't want to be an architect anymore, what am I? They've associated with this title for so long that it becomes a question of, okay, so you know, what, what else do you like to do? Or what about architecture do you like that you'd like to kind of you know, parlay into your full-time focus. Sometimes it's architecturally adjacent. Sometimes it's just finding a, another firm with a better fit or a slightly different scope of what they do. And often, and other times, or and oftentimes, it's it's somewhere wildly different. Um, you know, it could be in tech, it could be in sportswear. Like Jake, we had someone go off and be a um, a yacht consultant and designer. Um, we've had people go and work for Deloitte and management consulting and sustainability. Um, really, all all across. Across the map, and and that I think shows to the breadth and depth of of the types of people that are drawn to architecture and their varied interests and, and skill sets, especially as they go into the professional world and and hone and specialize in slightly different ways, or at least are able to to explore within the world itself. Mm. I love this idea of the noun crisis. <laughs> this is like a deep, certainly deep. Certainly, they see a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is a deep identity shift, but it's something that a lot of people come to on their own. Mm. I think we are um, occasionally thought of as those people that are stealing architects, good, you know, talented architects in the profession or who are, you know, actively trying to sell some, you know, unrealistic ideal or just, you know, our money grubbing, you know, greedy folk. And uh, most of that's true, but no, <laughs> sorry, couldn't help myself. No, um, I mean, really, that that couldn't be farther from the truth. And and in fact, um, clients come to us, and and what we do, as as Aaron mentioned, is we're we're asking a sort of deeper level beyond just what title would you like to have. I think it's quite frustrating, actually, that architecture students aren't just considered students of design. I also think it's quite frustrating that architecture firms don't hire other kinds of designers, industrial product. Uh, frankly, uh, I've never met an architect who is even close to as good of a uh, you know CGI specialist as my industrial design friends or product design friends. I mean, certainly there are some who are really good, but there are so many different ways to get to the world of design And as Aaron mentioned, we're taught how to learn. We're not taught the exact skills that we need in the profession. So I think we are kind of pro diversity of thought in not only beyond architecture profession and trying to pull people to see what else is out there, but also to bring other kinds of thought into architecture. Mm. We have had clients who are in business development or marketing or come from uh, visual design or graphic design backgrounds who are interested in architectural roles, who we have helped find jobs within the architect- architecture, engineering, and construction profession. So it works both ways. You are a, It does. You're a, you're a valve going both directions. Mm, and and side to side and you know all all manner of well, that, you know multi n dimensional uh, pathways. Well, well, again, that, that's very interesting. The points you're bringing up there about um, you know wanting to see the industry and architecture practices 
employing other disciplines because this is something that um is quite surprising in many ways um you know i often talk to other business consultants who are not who don't have an architecture background and they're often continually perplexed at why are the architects hiring or putting architects in charge of their marketing or in charge of their business development or in charge of these other aspects in their business? Like, what is that about? Like, you guys don't have any understanding of that. Why don't you just hire someone who knows what they're doing? And, and there is often a bit of a shift as well in, in businesses that we see that they're evolving, that when they do start doing that and open up to other specialists in, in industry, that their businesses tend to excel. And actually, it puts the architects into a role that they're better suited to, if you like, which is designing and creating and kind of doing the craft as opposed to being doing all these other sorts of activities. Um what would be your advice or, you know, how, how do you see the, a bridge being made, which is kind of more effective between industry and the training? Yeah. I mean, it's difficult too, because we have the perspective of, of only the places we've gone to mm -hmm. from an educational perspective or taught at, but what I, a couple of things that I feel, number one, I can't think, of any time in my undergraduate or graduate degree where a professor of mine referred to what we did as a business. There's a fundamental issue with that. Um, two, I think teaching people to recognize what they're good at and accept the things that they're not would be incredibly useful as well. And I'm, I'm actually awful. I was awful at this for a very long time. And there are certain things that I'm still awful at this with, which is to say that you're correct. I mean, frankly, if you're good at designing and you're, you're not necessarily educated in or interested in running the business aspects of a practice or any, any sort of creative endeavor, don't find someone who is good at it and, and allow them to help you and partner up. But I think there's this individualist mentality, particularly in school that gets fostered where you become somewhat empowered to, to learn so much that you feel like you can do anything. And this idea becomes, oh, I could figure this out. And the reality is you probably can, but you reach a maximum threshold of all the things that you can actually do and do well. And after a certain point, you're not doing anything well because you're doing too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we, we foster this culture of no. And, and what if we could do this? And, you know, I, we tell a story or Jake tells a story very frequently of actually a, a studio that we both took as students that we were just absolutely enamored with. We loved the professors. We loved the project. And he describes, you know, coming off of the final review exhausted, but so inspired by some of the things that they said that he got back to work on, on the project. And that's not to say that that was a futile endeavor because obviously the, the passion was there and the excitement to get that creative thing out is, is it's magic. There's, there's magic that happens there, but it's, it's inefficient and it's futile. And F, when it's done for a while, it, it hurts you, mm -hmm. right? It can hurt your business when it's done at an enterprise scale, but it hurts you as an individual in terms of your ability to, um, take care of yourself and, and be a, let's say a responsible member of, of the profession. I think what we could do about that is just have more open conversations about this experiment that we're all doing, which is trying to make it in the world of being a creative individual. That may happen in the field of architecture. That may happen designing shoes. That may happen, you know, being um, an advocate for a nonprofit for the value of, of design in underserved communities, um, which may have nothing to do with actually designing something. But we have a massive amount of, of creativity and passion and people who I go back to probably started off by wanting to do something good in the world. And we arm them with immense skills in creating, but this interface between themselves and society and also thinking, I think, bigger picture about their ability to do good in the world and how that affects their career. I don't think we talk about enough and I think we, we should talk about it more and as often as possible. And I think that's what we always say that, you know, we're, we're super lucky because we get to talk to these people all the time. You know, people will book a 20 minute chat with us and every week we're meeting, you know, on a good, on a week where we're not totally taxed, it's about four to five during the height of the pandemic. It was sometimes 10, 15, 20 people a week. And that was a little too much. Um, but we get to meet all these people and, and talk to them about, you know, what they love to do, what they're good at and what they mm. want to do in the world. And that's super exciting. 
Amazing. Do, um, do you think that the, for, for example, that the architectural education is damaging the profession in a way, or that, you know, there, there could be a, you know, there could be a, a, a way of educating people so that you know what you're getting into and that actually maybe there's a way of detaching architectural education from the profession, uncoupling it more, if you like, and that when you enter into architectural training, the end goal isn't becoming an architect. It's kind of unknown, as it is with many other disciplines. Like if you were to study mathematics, like you or, or or physics, even you know that there's just a hundred different possibilities. And I know people say this superficially. Oh, you know, you can do anything if you become architect. But that's not the reality. Once you're in, once you're in the degree, and the, the impact that it has on the profession, if you like, is that you know, when I work with a lot of um, architectural practices and they're looking for staff, that they can't find anybody who's got any construction knowledge, knowledge of building regs. There's like this big void in terms of actual, actual, you know, the, the kind of core competencies that a practicing architecture, architect working in construction has, and that that's not being fulfilled at university. So it's almost like, I don't know, in, in many ways, it's kind of, you know, is, is this a, a, a kind of marketing trickery of the architectural education? It's kind of pretending to be one thing and then actually it's not. And then it's withholding. What are your thoughts around about that and, and, the, and the kind of education's impact on the profession? I think it does go both ways. Um, I think the idea that as a professional or as a business owner that you're going to get someone out of school that is... Um, someone you don't have to train and mentor is a pipe dream. And it's not the ethos of our profession, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, you have always, one has always worked under a sort of a master in this case. I think if we really embrace it um, and there are firms who do this incredibly well, they take a new person onto a team and, you know, there's a team dynamic where everyone is good at a certain set of skills and they mentor that, that person and bring out what they're good at and, and work on what they're not. Um, I think if, profess- if, if the profession, if firms could foster that more and make that a bit more, um, a bit less opaque and a bit more, um, a bit more like what the way it's done and really well-run companies, I think the profession would be much better off. You know, there are metrics, there are, um, you know, KPIs, there are things that people know they're doing well versus not, as opposed to, you know, their PM sort of screaming at them or grunting. Um, That being said, I don't think that that puts academia off the hook. Um, We graduate about 10 times more architects every year than we're going to need over the next decade in terms of like traditional licensed efficient architects in the United States, I'm speaking based on like Bureau and labor statistic models here. So I think we can embrace the fact that we should be showing people that there's other things that they can be doing. Let the people who do want to be the more traditional architects go that route Mm -hmm. because there are definitely people that that's what they came here to do. And they're excited to go do that, but let the people who, you know, as Jake put it, you know, he didn't, he was told in the profession, he couldn't, he was not going to find what he was looking for. And then he found exactly what he was looking for. It looked just like architecture school, but it was at Adidas, right? Let people know that that exists out there. That's really for the entry level. But I I think part of what we do with our clients who are, you know, mid-career or late career is just reminding them of of that fact and reminding of them of, of the breadth and and ability that, that they can, um, they can go into if they, again, revision their re-envision their lives slightly outside of this title. But I, I do think it works both ways. I'd like to go just back briefly. The notion that architecture school and the architecture profession are inextricably connected seems... Antiquated. And I think that an architectural training is multifaceted. And those facets, one is very academic and sort of technically skill oriented. That is something that we get uh, quite a bit of in architecture school. And I really enjoy that. Mm. The other is a very 
apprentice focused model, something that most people in construction would get by not going to college, by instead choosing to explore a trade or examine a trade. We are expected to do both. I think that in the United States, it is not something that would ever be considered a blue collar job, something that you are, you know, getting your hands dirty, but it is. And it is also something that is tied very directly to the work of many other trade professionals in the construction industry. That knowledge can only be gained by experience or there needs to be a more AEC holistic focused degree if that's what we're trying to create in school. I'm not saying that that would be a bad thing. However, the magic of design, the pure joy of learning to take something apart with your eyes, understand the way that it's fabricated, understand the intent behind it, get into the other designer's brain just by looking at a chair or imagining how someone is supposed to sit in that chair. Those are not specific to architecture as an end goal. Mm. I would actually take academia farther afield into a more diverse set of experiences, diverse set of projects. We've seen an example of this at a place that Aaron and I both taught, which was not at all for college students. It was in fact for high school students. It's a, a company called Nuvu, Nuvu, and it's spelled N-U-V-U, and it's based in Cambridge. And that startup, which has now grown into this incredible educational franchise model that has you know outposts all across the world, uses two weeks studio-based teaching to teach young students a myriad set of skills. Could be coding. It could be fashion design, it could be furniture, it could be woodworking, it's, uh, you know, urban design, game design, all of these things. But touching on so many different areas that really, you know, architecture is, is very close to. Mm. So it's only these blinders that we've put up on the profession and, you know, those blinders, um, say, oh, well, you don't want to be an interior designer, you know, like how horrendous would that be? Or you don't want to go into, <laughs> you know, fashion. Like why would anyone go into fashion when you can dress up a building? You know, there's, it's, it's sort of ridiculous to, uh, you know, to say that. And then when you get older, you get to see that people's careers, uh, I mean, they are so varied. They are so nonlinear. And for us to get to hear these stories about you know, people coming into architecture in their mid thirties with an entire life in, you know, whether it's sports management or someone coming from, you know, the legal profession or coming from somewhere else. And then, you know, they, they sort of have uh, a very different perspective of what they're trying to learn in architecture school, you know, and often it's not, oh, I want to learn everything I need to do to be able to put a building together. Mm -hmm. Very frequently it's, well, I just, I know that I'm in love with the way that my architecture peers speak and think, and I want to take that back with me into some other profession. I, I really want to go into consulting, but I know I'm going to stick through this degree program because there's nothing like it. And that's very true and hard to reconcile when you sort of look back retroactively at which a lot of clients are doing from the position of still being in the profession for a decade or two decades um, and thinking kind of what if. So how, how do you establish these links into other industries and kind of, you know, do, uh, do, do you have a, are you actively looking at other industries and other businesses and, and kind of thinking, oh, an architect would be useful here mm -hmm. or are people, are other companies and businesses coming to you or is it a mixture of working with a, a specific client and they've got their own individual interests and then that kind of, how do you, how are you making these, these bridges, if you like, these connections? 
when you say you, I think I'll take this from the point of, of us as out of architecture yes. rather than as a client establishing themselves in another industry. Yes. Um, certainly it's a mix of all of those things. And it really began with <laughs> an unabashed um, slew of emails and phone calls and LinkedIn messages and texts and uh, a, a, you know, a sort of repetitious, Hey, what do you do? You know, what, what, what is your, what is your job like? You know, what, why would someone with my background not be qualified? And as Aaron mentioned, you know, we were our first clients. I did this with game design. We both did this with with teaching in many ways. I, I don't know, for those of you listening who are in academia, bless you. <laughs> it, is a, uh, it is a tricky place to navigate and certainly one that breeds this sense of imposter syndrome. But, um, you know, overcoming this idea that, well, I'm not qualified because I'm considered an architect, you know, overcoming that noun is probably the very first hurdle. But Aaron and I have you know, ever since we went into other parts of our universities and, you know, worked with the dendrology department or went to the business school or went to the school of, uh, you know, our uh, hotel administration, we have always been curious about the way in which uh, architects engage with other professions. Mm. Most architects see this through their studio courses, though. You are asked to learn about a bird and then design a house for that bird or, you know, design a house for a librarian or design a house for a doctor or design a doctor's office or all of these things. And of course, you know, you can't just build a space for a dentist unless you understand what a dentist does. But we have kind of taken that a little bit um, to the extreme and thought, well, what if we embedded ourselves in these people's professional lives or professions or these companies, what would that look like? How would we be of use? And if you take it to that kind of silly extreme, it plays out really nicely. It certainly is something that we've seen uh, as, you know, these aha moments from clients over and over again. And, uh, you know, Aaron sort of uh, mentioned that in the summer, we have a, a book coming out. It's uh, aptly titled Out of Architecture. And in there, there are some case studies. And one of the chapters is elaborating on someone who has kind of come to this inflection point, this, this crisis mode. And in the conversation, arrives at this, this moment where they realize, wow, you know, uh, as an architect, I was always fascinated by putting things together, but really in the sense of putting together a piece of, you know, clothing for myself I and mean, architects are obsessed with how we dress and, you know, whether it's all black or whether it's sort of asymmetrical, um, that is a, a, a way of expressing. And we've had this happen actually with a couple of, of clients in, in real life and they stumble through and, and quickly sort of ask, is there any way that I could take that interest of, of fashion and apply my design skills to it and, and turn that into a career, those aha moments, they are way more frequent than I think a lot of people listening might believe. And that is just the first uh, step into then, great, let's write a bunch of emails and make phone calls and find out more about this, this question. Could you share with us a little bit, a little bit more of some of the some of these success stories because they're wonderfully captivating and compelling and and, and I and I get the sense that they it really starts to illustrate the the breadth of possibility if you like. Are there any that sometimes it defines or sometimes it depends on what the client deems as success. Mm. Um, so one of the one of the exercises we we. So sometimes we'll have clients who who know like, hey, I'm really interested in, you know, going to work for Sidewalk Labs or I want to move into tech or, you know, whatever. Um, but sometimes we have 
clients, as I mentioned earlier, that are coming from a position of burnout and they're having a really, they have a very hard time envisioning a future that is not where they're at right now. So one of the exercises that we do with clients to try to understand where they can start to say, this is what I want versus I know what I don't want is we ask them to look at, you know, take out either their notebook or, you know, open up their iCal or whatever they use to manage their time and go to like a year in the future or whatever their timeline happens to be. And we're like, just plan out a week of what you want to be doing with your time. Include the personal stuff, not that you necessarily have to tell us what that is, but, you know, the, the example that Jake and I use, um, even though neither of us has ever done it, is hot yoga. If you want to be doing hot yoga twice a week, put that on there. If you want to be in a, a shop twice a week as a part of your job or as a part of a hobby that you have, put that on there. And we try to get them to, to back into what they consider to be success. And what's exciting about that is that that's really a process that they end up owning Because it starts with a little bit more of that introspection and also a little bit of of iterating and hope on how they could be spending what we think is their most most valuable resource, which is time. Money is super important. It's important to us. It's something we talk about with clients all the time, but it's, it's not the core being for why I think people come to us. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it's definitely an, an, an overcurrent, but it's really, I think about how you, you spend the creative capital that you have, um, in terms of, of what that individually designed success ends up being, I mean, that's it ends up being also our, our favorite part. You know, we've had clients who their version of success is us empowering them or helping to empower them to go talk to their boss about or talk to their institution or wherever they're working and, and reorganize how they work so that they could start a new initiative within the company or go off and affect some more sort of managerial change in, in different aspects of it or move to a, um, a more specialized consulting role. Sometimes it's completely turning their back on where they're working and being like, nope, I'm going to go do something completely different and I never want to see you all again. Um, sometimes it's starting a whole new whole new thing with some of their colleagues. It it ends up being this you know really unique and exciting process that we get to, to be a small part of and, and help with and, and witness, which is which is great. One specific example of a client that I think really stands out in my mind um, is is relatively recent. This person, and again, you know, all of our clients are, um, you know, we we take confidentiality extremely seriously. So I will be, uh, you know, as as specific as I can be in this circumstance. But understood. This person is. Uh, couple years out of school. And as with many of our clients, um, they came from a a brand name school, uh, this one particularly in the US, where you would imagine that, you know, their colleagues are going to be Nobel Prize winners and, you know, famous lawyers and doctors and presidents and all of these things. And so, uh, you know, even, even beyond that, they have had a list of experiences, a list of internships at some of the top firms in the world. Again, you know, all of the three letter famous firms that, that we would uh, drool over in school. And they came to us and said, I am nowhere near where I thought I would be in my career. And I guess this begs a question to us. Well, okay, where where did you think you would be? Is it location? Is it salary? Is it, no, 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 no. It's none of those things. None of those things. What it is, is I love mixed media. I love robotics. I love all of these experimental technologies that I thought were just coming into the fold in architecture. And I've been at the best firms, so to speak, you know, the, the top tier I haven't seen any of that play out in a meaningful way. You know, I've been put through the ringer. I've put in my 60 hour, 80 hour, a hundred hour weeks. I have cuts, bruises, you know, all of these things from just pouring myself into my work. And I'm, you know, sitting here next to my partner who decided to go work for a 
Facade Consulting Company and is making double what I'm making and gets to play with all of these technologies and gets to do all these things, help me Mm. to, you know, find that path because I thought I was doing everything right. So the success that this person found was not only did they nurture some of the conversations with other firms that they had been speaking to, architectural firms, in such a way that they felt empowered to say, I will only do this kind of work. I will only come work for you if we can guarantee, if we can put in the contract not only an appropriate salary, but an appropriate amount of time and resources allocated to this goal, which in this case could have been, you know, digital fabrication. But we also pointed out, uh, and this person, you know, very aggressively and thoughtfully applied to a number of other fabrication industries and was able to land an architecturally adjacent role that not only was immediately focused on the work that they wanted to do, but it also was welcoming of the kind of research that they had been pursuing in their off time at these firms. It was interested in how can we bring this into the work that our company is doing? How can we use this to add value to our clients? Mm. And the icing on the cake was this person had never negotiated a role before they went through a back and forth of three different rounds and not only was, uh, you know, used this as an opportunity to increase their salary, but they got the exact clarity from leadership of both companies on what that position would look like. And they ended up choosing what, you know, now several months later has proven to be the perfect role for them. Uh, and it, it's, so satisfying. And yet Aaron and I can take almost none of the credit. We tell our clients before they ever give us a cent, like you can do this without us. You know, we are just the, we're your confidant. We're the friend in your corner. We are here to support you and push you, but this is your search. This is your career. And we watch them almost every time you know, to take steps forward. And as Aaron mentioned, some of those steps are small and some of those steps are massive. Amazing. I love, I, this is so, so inspiring to hear. Um, and so, yeah, just, just very, you know, it's, it's great. It's really, really great. And um, personally, a, a story that's resonating with me very deeply. And so many of the people I've had on the podcast of have shared a similar journey, if you like, of, of, and part of its, you know, identity, part of its finding your passion, part of its dealing with this heartbreak and loss of, hold on a minute. I was deeply involved in these interesting ideas at university. And now I'm working in industry. I feel like I'm removed from this, you know, and, 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 you know, if I'd, if I'd seen a service like what you guys are doing, 10, 15 years ago, I would have been, I'd have been on the phone. And I, I'm very <laughs> flattered to hear you say that, but I think it, it comes from, I, I don't know how directly this relates, but your, uh, your recent episode that you did uh, with the founder of fuck being humble was an incredible eye opening experience for me. And there was a segment in there where she says, I'm, I'm disgusted by the phrase, you know, well, let your design speak for itself. Let your work speak for itself. And I think, you know, I, th- I ruminated on that for quite some time and, and felt maybe, you know, there's, there's some deep connection here to the way that we train architects to be singularly thoughtful about architecture, but to really think about nothing else. And, you know, okay, like your work is supposed to speak for you, but I think we're supposed to speak for ourselves and we are supposed to voice the things that we want. And if more architects did that, the profession would look way different because 
as you mentioned, you know, the, you expect to be going into these big firms and to see, wow, like, you know, I, this person that I admire who has openly, you know, touted the benefits of this new, whatever it is, technology, design methodology, blah, blah, blah. They are going about it in the same way that uh, everyone else is. And I think that there's, there's an opportunity for people that, that enter those places to, instead of humbly just accepting the reality to question and to proffer advice to, you know, people they might consider to be architects or mentors or, but instead we're told don't question, you know, you will understand in the future. Mm. And that happens all the time. It happens in your first drawing class. Don't ask why we're drawing a thousand lines. Just do it. You know, <laughs> just, just do it. You'll get it, you know, at the end of the semester. And then you kind of get it and you understand line weight. And then you go to the next class and they say, don't ask why we're, you know, building cubes. Just, just do it. Just do a hundred cubes. Okay. I'll do it You know, over so and over. Like and then a, you get into the, it's like a military indoctrination technique. Mm, isn't it? it is. It's very cult like, uh, but you didn't hear that here. Uh, <laughs> and, and then you go to the, you know, to third year and they say, all right, well, you won't really understand architecture until you get to the profession. And then you get to the profession. They say, well, you won't really understand architecture until you've been in it for five years. And then you get to the point of being a project architect and they say, well, you don't even really understand, you know, construction administration until you've done five projects and you get 40 years into the profession and you look back and you say, well, I really still don't get it, you know, or I get it, but it could have been explained in so much simpler terms. Mm. I could have been told that, you know, this is this and that is that. And you you can pick and choose. You know, you don't have to just follow the same path. You can specialize, you can leave, you can come back. I wish that someone had told me I could leave and you're always welcome back. I never heard that. Oh. I actually had an interview at the same time I was interviewing for Adidas and they said, well, where we can't compete with that offer. And uh, this is a small firm here in, in Portland that I actually really admire. And they said, yeah, but you'll never come back. You know, we're just, it won't happen. And I said, why not? You know, what if I go learn something and I, you know, wouldn't you like to learn from this other profession, this other industry? And they said, yeah, but it, it just won't happen. It never happens. And we've seen so many people leave and no one comes back. <laughs> And I wanted to say so badly, doesn't that point to everything that's wrong with you, you idiot? <laughs> and I didn't. Um, <laughs> oh, mm. So interesting. So interesting. The, the other part of this as well in, you know, what I see a lot is people go through this experience of, you know, the disconnect, the fallout, the kind of the heartbreak of like, where was all the things that I was promised in the architectural career and, you know, it's not happening. And then they have, and if they haven't come across something like, you know, what you guys are, are discussing and like, they haven't had the ability to um, look outside of the industry or try and find a pathway into something else. Then the idea emerges of I'll start my own business, which is, you know, I'm a big advocate for business, obviously, and for running architecture practices, but it's also one of the biggest curses of the industry is that we've got 80% of all architects working in a practice of between one and five people. And everyone's searching for something. They don't quite know what they're searching for. And there's still a lack of business basics. And now you've just made what was already a hard career even harder. And I do think like, you know, starting a business isn't always the answer. In fact, like you should really take a step back. And again, I, I, I probably imagine in myself, if, if I'd come across something like what you guys are talking, I would have certainly explored avenues in different industries before having the great idea of setting up my own, my own business, which was its own gem, which I'm in retrospect now, I'm very glad that it all happened, but it was, it wasn't, it wasn't a straightforward journey and a, a particularly, it, you know, it wasn't without its bumps, if you like. Um, 
which again, what are, what are your thoughts on that? On like, you know, people setting up their own practices and actually maybe you shouldn't have done that or. I think I agree with you completely. And I, I think it's un, it's unfortunate that not just in architecture school, but in, in even high school or, or earlier, you don't learn kind of fundamentally basic things that you need, right? The basics of accounting, nutrition, fitness, like what do you need to feed yourself? What do you need to remain gainfully employed or, or to, to become a productive member of society in the, in the world that we live in? And, and how do you, you know, keep your body, uh, you know, uh, working right, all things considered. So I agree with you. I personally believe that there should be more business education in, in architecture. Um, and I try to do that with the, the ProPrac course that I teach, but the reality is, you know, that's an entire entire another field, right? But doctors take courses and how to run their own practices before they graduate um, with their MDs. Um, and maybe it's just in their DNA, but lawyers do as well in terms of know how to, how to bill and, and run um, run the, the endeavors that they run. However, there's also a fundamental understanding of what doctors and lawyers do. And there's not a fundamental understanding across the board in society of what architects do. That's both a blessing and a curse because you can set up your own shop and define what it is that you do without society necessarily putting their vision of what they do on you. But you're correct. It's, you know, 90% of businesses fail. Um, what's great about architects, I think, is that you're very used to failing and getting back up after you fail. So if, if architects are willing and designers are willing to treat their business and their career as, as we say, like a design problem and not be so, um, you know, with blinders on or so, so stubborn to say that, no, this is how everyone who's done it before me has done it. I have to make it work this way. Um, you're going to, you're going to continually fail and not fail up. Mm. That being said, I, I think there is some ownership to be taken in, even at the student level. I, I think school promises us nothing right? Life promises us nothing. But architects are trained to make something out of nothing. That's the thing that people are fascinated by. You know, clients will throw ideas at you and a Pinterest board and a brief that you'll probably, you know, completely rewrite and you make something out of nothing. You do not only have to do that with buildings. You can do that with your business. You can do that with your career. You could do that with whatever role you've, you've been given in a company that's given you some form of latitude to craft your own, your own time and your own workday. And I think that that's really exciting. And if, if you can use the disconnect to your advantage, was it, which is to say, take a step back mm -hmm. and just realize that you are armed with the tools already, regardless of, of where you are in your career, just dismantle some of the preconceived notions about what it is you think success is and what you think the profession wants and needs from you. Great. Um, just to kind of follow, follow on that, follow on from that, um, money, money and value. And you guys are, again, you're, you're in this very interesting space between architectural education the profession and other industries and of course you know in the architecture industry worldwide there is this constant complaint reality that it's you know the money for the investment is messed up it doesn't always add up can you make more money outside of architecture being an architect absolutely and there are companies that value that exact skill even whether it's as a retail designer, whether it's as a workplace designer or workplace strategist or environmental designer, these are all terms for <laughs> architects beyond the architectural profession or rather beyond traditional architecture practice. I've, uh, uh, you know, even been through the experience of discovering that corporate real estate is basically architecture project management. And you can make two, three times the salary, have a regulated 40 hour a week job and work sometimes. for a single company. Sometimes. Yes, that's not always true. Um, you know, but uh, again, the, uh, the idea there comes back to, well, what are those companies selling? Because they're not selling their ability to design their own retail storefronts. 
you know, I mean, uh, I, you know, Apple is not going around telling everyone what you're paying us for is these beautiful Apple stores that you come in. You're paying for the product and the experience that you get because of it, of course. Um, but they're selling something else in a way that is really compelling and that they need built environment to accomplish that goal. There's all kinds of jobs like that. And yes, you can make a lot more money. I was extremely shocked to leave grad school and receive an offer for $40,000 leaving the, uh, I guess it, maybe it's not the most expensive, but one of the most expensive institutions in the country um, with an enormous amount of debt and just having the realization at that point that, oh my goodness, I, I, I have to pay off, you know, years of tuition at $60,000 a year, $70,000 a year on a $40,000 a year salary and continue to live and continue to acquire the objects that I have been trained to be obsessed with because I'm a designer. <laughs> and so I love beautiful things. How <laughs> am I supposed to make all of this work? You know, I mean, the chair that I studied in school that I want to buy is thousands of dollars and my <laughs> monthly income is less than that chair. Oh. That doesn't seem to add up really. Um, so we're, there's, we're, there's an element of cruelty in that as well, mm -hmm. isn't there? There's this kind of, you know, I like the way that you, you, you put that so eloquently that, you know, we're, we're kind of trained to lust after these objects and even design them and be involved in their, creation but they will you know we won't be able to experience them as a consumer if you like well and, and at best it's a it's a it's an element of cruelty at worst it's it's <laughs> keeping us from being you know diverse in so many different ways um it keeps it a sort of wealthy noble gentleman's profession and that's it's it's not sustainable um and for the love of, of architecture, for the love of creativity, for the love of having influence in the world, whether it's a, a digital or physical or a built product, um, that's not sustainable. And it's uh, to some extent, it's the Ouroboros, right? We're sort of eating ourselves here, but it's also not making architecture any better. It's probably making yeah. it much, much worse. And I think as much as, it's, it's fun that like Jake and I joke about it all the time and, and we poke fun at, at it, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's also a different breed of cruel, I think. Um, especially because I think they, one week we could do better as a profession, as a society, but two, there's just actually no reason not to, it would benefit everybody in the profession. Mm -hmm. Um, and outside of it, actually, we would design better buildings if we had different voices, at the table designing those buildings. So it, it's a systemic and sustain a, 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 an issue of sustainability on a multitude of, of levels and factors, I think. Love it. Brilliant. I think that's the perfect place to, to conclude. Um, thank you very much for your expertise, your deep insight into academia, the industry, and this kind of, you know, wonderful space that you're occupying and, and the work that you're, you're doing. Um, and if anybody wants to get in contact with you, I know, I know for a fact that we have a multitude of listeners that are going through these emotional turmoil or the, the sort of wrestling with the conflict of, you know, um, the, what did you call it? The, the noun crisis and yes. should I be doing this? And actually my heart's over here. If they want to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to, to do that? Well, we love to hear from people all over the world. We have clients in uh, every continent except Antarctica at this point. So uh, <laughs> for any of your listeners in Antarctica, hit us up. Um, but if they want to reach out, we have a website, outofarchitecture.com. Uh, on there, you can book an introductory call with us. You can reach out to us uh, via email uh, or the contact link. We also have uh, an Instagram account at Out of Architecture. And we are both uh, very active on LinkedIn and would welcome uh, anyone listening to connect with us and 
use our network as your network, you know, peruse, browse, explore, think about what your next step might look like. And it, it might just be uh, someone down the street. It might be someone that you've never thought about reaching out to before, but absolutely. We would love to hear from, uh, from anyone who wants to consider, you know, redesigning their career. Amazing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. It's been great. Thank you very much for having us. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.